Today we're talking about one of the few G.I. Joes with an ampersand in the code name that doesn't come with an animal partner, a cool looking fate cam up Siouxland operator named Hit and Run. Let's talk about him. First, thanks for watching JLS Comics. Hit that subscribe button so you can keep up with all of our weekly content. And with that out of the way, let's jump right into our story. Brent Scott was born in Sioux City, Iowa. His Action Force counterpart named Brian Scott hails from Basildon, Essex, England. Tragically, at just three years old, a drunk driver hit their family's car and orphaned Brent, and custody of him was turned over to an institutional health facility where young Brent then became a ward of the state of Iowa. Growing up, Brett was an avid runner, and this, coupled with his fearless and tough attitude, set him on a course through life which he viewed as an obstacle course to be confronted at maximum speed. But at that young age, Brent still felt trapped by the facility he lived in, and so he would escape often, scaling sheer walls and running for miles away from his home up into the mountains. But when he was inevitably caught, Brent would say he wasn't running away, that he was just practicing. When he was old enough, Brent was transferred from state custody to the United States Army, where he used his running and wilderness skills, passing through basic and AIT as 11 Bravo, and then passing Army Mountain Warfare School to add the SQIE Military Mountaineer. He was so good here that he earned his own achievement medal. Action Force Hit and Run joined the British Army's 2nd Battalion and fought in the Falklands War in 1982 and was part of the 2nd Parachute Regiment that took on 1,400 Argentinians and won. He was also wounded at Wireless Ridge attacking an enemy bunker and then commissioned to SAS to train and stand up a special PPD force for the Sultan of Oman. But with either version, this wasn't enough for Corporal Scott. He wanted to push himself farther and faster. He wanted to push his limits to not rest on his laurels. So when he learned of an elite strike force called G.I. Joe, he transferred in, which is when he finally felt like he'd found a new family. AF's Corporal Scott joined Action Force, which became G.I. Joe's European contingent. It was here that he took on the codename Hit and Run after passing over preliminary names like Rope Burn and Night Raid. Lieutenant Falcon commented on Brent's skills where on one file card he said, Infantrymen don't march, they run. They run to get to the battle, they run during the battle, and they run to get away from the battle. The army doesn't call it running, they call the first advancing, the second maneuvering, and the last disengaging. Hit and Run calls it all running, and he's real good at it. Besides, a guy who can run in pitch darkness over dangerous terrain carrying a full load is perfect for Night Force. In the Marvel Comics and Larry Hama, a real American hero comic book series continuity, Hit and Run first appeared in issue 80. In that issue, a new and highly unstable landmass appeared in the Gulf of Mexico, about 200 miles off the coast of Cobra Island. Both Cobra and G.I. Joe wanted to make a play for the new island, either a defensive position for Cobra or a perfect staging point for a G.I. Joe offensive. Wild Bill flew a C-130 Hercules over the island with a jump team led by Outback, but sent out by Jumpmaster Ripcord. This new team was Hardball, Muskrat, Charbroil, and Hit and Run. Outback and Ripcord walked into the cargo bay to see everyone except Hit and Run in their jump seats. Where was Hit and Run? Well, he was on the floor doing push-ups. But they were approaching the AO and the green light over the drop zone would soon be on, so they had to secure their gear. And after buddy checks and thumbs up, the Jumpmaster sent the team out the back for a textbook, low altitude, low opening, deploying rapidly into a hot zone full of bats, throwing a wall of hot jacketed lead up at them. They managed to capture a ridge from a platoon of bats and held the high ground, though Hit and Run seems to have somehow lost the stripes on his face paint, but then his face paint turned blue and in the next panel the stripes were back, just in time to give Outback and Ripcord a lesson in trigonometry. He was able to school them on how the maggot tank barrels would not be able to elevate high enough for the Cobra to lob rounds down onto their position, though instead Cobra fired at the cliff edge. They continued to hold the ridge against a constant barrage of enemy fire, even as the island began sinking, and while awaiting an assist from the team on the Rolling Thunder, they shot their way down to the beach and got onto the Rolling Thunder as the island continued to sink. A tomahawk dropped a hook and flew them all away, leaving Dr. Mindbender, Firefly, and a viper floating and stranded in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. Hit and Run then made the jump over to the special missions line. His first special mission was in issue 17. On their way in the Herc, Stalker told them that they were on their way to Siliconville, California for a hostage rescue mission at a tech company called Nexus Tech, a company owned by a guy named Wendell which had ties and connections to the government and black budget military contracts. The local police and the FBI were squabbling over jurisdiction G.I. Joe was called in due to the Defense Department's security and national security elements to the incident. The hostage takers, of course, were a group of vipers led by Scrap Iron, just the type for Stalker's strike team to take on. On scene, they quickly locked and loaded. Stalker had Hardball and Muskrat take the first floor while he, Shockwave, and Hit and Run would breach from the roof. Hardball laid down some cover smoke while Hit and Run sent his grappling hook to the roof and they all quickly ascended the sheer face of the bunker-like compound. Then Shockwave blew a hole in the roof and Hit and Run was the first to go through the smoldering gash in the rooftop. 
They were then able to link up with the ground team and rescue the hostages, though it turns out that Wendell Freed was overbilling the government to the tune of millions of dollars. So he'd hired Cobra to break in to destroy that evidence, and as a payment for that, they would get the missile guidance chip technology that had been developing on one of those government contracts. But Hit and Run and the team were able to stop that from happening. In Special Mission 22, Hit and Run was opping on another hostage rescue mission with Chuckles, Lady J, and Shockwave. This was another assignment from FBI agent Saxon, the same guy who had given them the Nexus Tech op ord. There were agents all around the farmhouse and Saxon wanted to go in for the rescue, but the problem was with the flatlands, they would quickly be detected and they could lose the hostages. Lady J commandeered a sedan and Hit and Run hung onto the side that was away from the farmhouse as she drove in closer. The white-clad hit-and-run rolled off the side of the car into a snowbank at the gate and then entered a drainage pipe to get closer to the house. But he had to jump up and run after one of the terrorists emptied an Ingram into Lady J. He was about to breach the house but Shockwave told him to slow down after he realized one of the guys with an M16 was actually the family's patriarch and that M16 was the kid's toy gun. A real terrorist picked up a handgun and so hit-and-run shot him center mass and he flew out a window. A female terrorist tried to make it to a small prop plane, but then the dad, who it turned out was a Marine Corps sniper, took her out with the Joes all around him. In Special Mission 23, Hit and Run was on the flight deck of the USS Flag with Stalker, Leatherneck, Muskrat, and Tunnel Rat doing BZO calibration as Wild Bill and Scoop landed in a Dragonfly to deliver their next mission orders. For that mission, on the way to Sierra Gordo, Hit and Run talked with the new guy named Scoop and told him he needs to check his gear out down to the bullets in his magazines since they were made by whoever gave the US government the cheapest contract and one bad bullet could jam up his M16A2 when he's supposed to be covering Hit and Run. Their mission was to extract the leader of the Sierra Gordo counter-revolutionaries, a guy named El Jefe, who'd been kidnapped by Destro in the Iron Grenadiers. So they rappelled down into the Sierra Gordo jungle with Hit and Run on the right flank as they quickly set up a perimeter the quietest way possible. Hours later, they found their perfect ambush spot. Stalker had them set up while Leatherneck, Muskrat, and Hit and Run took all their rocks except the radio rig back along the evasion route to the rally point. But a DX quickly broke out and Hit and Run took a round in the knee and Stalker had to help him walk back to the extraction point wounded. That issue came out in July of 1989. The next month, Hit and Run appeared in G.I. Joe European Mission's final issue, issue 15. And though this came out after he was shot and wounded, this issue is actually a reprint of Marvel UK's Action Force Monthly 15, so a different continuity. In the story, entitled Knights in Armor, Hit and Run was on a team with Tunnel Rat, Mainframe, Fast Draw, and Crazy Legs in the empty pipeline of an oil field in the deserts of an emirate in the Gulf of Arabia, which was now controlled by Cobra operatives. They made it out and assaulted the Wellhead Tower, stopping Cobra from installing and detonating incendiary charges. But this Hit and Run, remember it's Brian, not Brent, were able to stop them and save the day. For the Devil's Due continuity, Hit and Run was part of the infantry troop out on reserve status, as indicated in the Data Desk Handbook. He was then reinstated during the battle against Serpentor at the Coil on Cobra Island. Many years later, back in the main ARAH title after IDW Publishing and Larry Hama picked up the original numbering, Hit and Run once more appeared, combat ready, once again. When the Bob Graves rescue op down in Sierra Gorda went sideways, Hit and Run was called up as part of Clutch's relief team along with Cross Country, Lightfoot, Alpine, Charboil, Ace, Wildcard, Spirit, and a big old mean dog. They covertly inserted via a privately owned twin fuselage Fairchild C-82. Hit and Run sat right in the front bumper of the mean dog, his rifle at low ready. They were met by a V-100 armored car on the tarmac of the Rio Lindo International Airport, but the M-200-200 Mike Mike Cannon on the mean dog made quick work of it. Hit and Run took point as they moved out to relieve and save Alpha and Bravo teams. But first, Shipwreck's bird partner Polly led Hit and Run and the relief team to a hangar where Spirit and Duke were about to be assassinated by Revanche Robotics troopers and they rescued them. And then as they all worked with General Mercado to locate Alpha and Bravo teams in the terror drone they were stuck in, Lola Graves arrived in country to save her husband. She jumped on a motorcycle and headed into the jungle, which forced the Joes to jump into action, and they all got on the Mean Dog to follow her with Hit and Run once again on the front bumper. The Mean Dog made it to the Terrodrome, and so Hit and Run and the team moved out to establish a security perimeter while the others swept and cleared the Terrodrome. The rescue was a success. And speaking of rescue missions, Hit and Run made another appearance for the Sean Collins Throwdown Rescue Op after Sean was captured and imprisoned in Springfield by Cobra and Laura 343. For that mission, he rode into town on one of the buses, now apparently in his Tiger Force uniform. His what, you ask? We'll get to that in a moment. Due to the timing of his release, Hit and Run did not make it to the Sunbow or Deke animated series. In fact, his only animation came in the form of a television commercial for his debut issue. Hit and Run's first action figure was released in 1988. He came with his iconic green and black look with his face paint, red lens goggles, a helmet that's much more pro-tech than K-Pot, along with his climbing gear like the backpack and grappling hook, along with a knife and a blowback 9mm Colt Model 635 SMG. 
It's an extremely light weapon, but when you're scaling a cliff face, the less weight you have, the better. Though it does take more on full auto to control, recoil, and muzzle climb. His Impel trading card says that he has an M16A1, but this is not correct, though his M635's design is based on the 5.56 AR-15 M16 design. It does say that his battle bag is filled with frag and smoke grenades, anti-personnel mines, and he uses this with his other gear to raid enemy encampments, destroy them, and disappear into the darkness with his camo face paint. A Target exclusive version also came with a camouflage parachute. Estrella's Commando Zemasau figure in Brazil was Alpinista, a name exclusive to Brazil, which makes sense since we already have a mountaineering expert named Alpine. In 1991, Hit and Run was one of just a handful of European exclusive figures to be carded with Tiger Force. It was the same mold, but now he was blue, green, black, and orange, and this version came with his Action Force name and birthplace. In 2009, he was included with the Assault on Cobra Island box set, along with Zap, Altitude, Outback, Rakondo, Chuckles, and Wetsuit. And though it never made it into production, G.I. Joe figure designer Mark Pennington, Kurt Rowan, and Greg Burnson had another version of Hit and Run planned to be released in 1995 for the planned Battle Rangers line. This version of Hit and Run would have been the driver of the X-5-3 Stealth Tank, a tank that was later repurposed for the Sergeant Savage line after the mainline plans were axed. 2013 Hit and Run, which was boxed by G.I. Joe Collectors Club in the Nocturnal Fire set exclusive to a G.I. Joe convention that year, used this design. Then controversy hit. At Joe Con in 2012, the G.I. Joe Collectors Club revealed a concept case for the 30th anniversary, but it went unproduced. So in 2014, when they finally announced that the next wave of FSS releases would include a hit and run, and using images of that concept case version in their promo, many believed that cool concept case version would be the one to be released, but as you can see here, it wasn't. This caused outcry and backlash in the fandom, and basically forced the Collector's Club to retool the design. These later versions got more of a lightweight helmet or Mitch helmet to afford a more ballistic production than his previous Protech versions. And that same year, a gray and red figure was released as part of a box set called Vanishing Act, along with Zartan and Torpedo for the 50th anniversary line. And so to sum up Hit and Run, we turn to a quote of his from one of his file cards where he says, Only pack what you can carry, and then add one more ammo clip. And with that, that's a wrap on this one, my friends. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, and you'll be one of the first to know when I upload videos just like this every week. I'm Jesse, this is JLS Comics, and I'll see you soon.